Anyhow, we have a few things that we're going to cover regarding CSS. Um, before we move on to a bigger design discussion, and again, uh, I'm not sure if we'll hit all these today or, or what, or at what point we will, but we'll, we'll, we'll uh, have at it one at a time. First thing I want to do is I want to look at the border CSS attribute that we looked at last time. All right, I put a border on some things, I don't know, just for the heck of it. Um, but if you look closely at that border attribute, it's a little bit different than some of the other CSS attributes we've seen before. All right, if you remember, I put, I created a class for equipment, and I said everything that was related to equipment that had a class of equipment would get uh, a certain style. And in this case, it was uh, a border around it. Now, if we look at the CSS code for that, you'll notice that the CSS code looks a little different than the typical CSS code. Because the typical CSS code is something like the name of an attribute, a colon, and then a value. Now, the border is the name of the attribute, border. Then there's like three values here. You know, what's up with that? All right. Actually, even the margin's like that. We have a margin, and then we have three or two values rather. All right. So what's up with that? There are certain CSS attributes that we can take a shorthand for. All right. In other words, we can uh, use sort of a shorthand to define several CSS properties in 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 one at one time. And the border is one example, the margin's another example, and we'll be seeing a, a bunch of these throughout uh, the course. And it's entirely a personal preference which form of the syntax that you use. Really, the border is really a mix of, in this case, there's actually three attributes associated with border. There is a border color. There is a border type, and there's a border width. I could have specified the border as border color, black, semicolon, border type, solid, border width, what did I say, two pixels. I could have done that and specified each attribute individually. <coughs> but because they're all about a border, I can do that in a shorthand. And this is typically what I do, because I'm lazy. All right? I would typically do something like I did in this example, where instead I would say border, black, solid, two pixels. Now how does it know what is what in this? Well. Black, it knows, is a color. So it knows that I must mean, by it I mean the browser, it knows that I must mean that I want the border color to be black. Likewise, solid can only be a border type. That's not, a, you know, the word solid is not a color, it's not a width or anything like that. So it knows I must be referring to the border type. Lastly, border of 2px, well 2px isn't a color, it's not a, a width or, 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 wait a minute, it is a width. It's not a color or a style. So the browser is smart enough to say, hey, we made one declaration for border that includes these three properties. Well, black has to be the color. Solid has to be the, um, the uh, uh, type. And two pixels has to be the width. So I could have done this this way or this way. Either way, and it really doesn't matter. You can do that with any attributes that like start with the same thing. All right. Um, for example, if you notice, I've also done this with margin. And I said margin of two pixels and auto. 
there actually is four margins, right, that I could set individually. There's a top margin, there is the right margin, bottom margin, and the left margin. All right. There are CSS properties for each of those individually. So I could say, I could say, I just couldn't write it. I could say margin dash top 0px. Margin right auto. Margin oops, dash bottom. 0px margin left auto. With margins, if I use the shortcut, the shorthand, what it does is it uses however many numbers I, there, uh, I, I put there to sort of go around the whole cycle. So if I say margin 1px, then the top margin's 1, the right margin, the bottom margin, and the left margin are all 1. If I say margin 1px, 2px, then the top would be 1, the right would be 2, and then you repeat again. The bottom would be 1, the left would be 2. If I were to say three numbers, which almost no one ever does. All right. Then the top margin would be one, the right would be two, the bottom would be three, and then would start again with one on the left. That's not particularly useful, although that's the way it works. Lastly, if I were to say margin and give four numbers, then it would be top, bottom, or top, right, bottom, and left. I have no idea if you put five numbers in what would happen. I think it would use the first four and ignore the rest. You can try it if you want. I'll probably take points off. Yes? Um. So I get this. I, mechanically, I understand this. I guess my question is because you know this is set up to adjust automatically with both screen size and window availability. This feels like a useless sort of attribute that we're working on. It, it, you understand? I'm sort of, I guess I'm trying to figure out. It, it's automatically adjusting anyway. Well. Keep in mind, the, the question was, is why do we bother with this margin because the, we have our margin set to adjust automatically and to keep things centered. Yeah, we do, for that one particular div. You can put margins on anything. You can put margins on headings if you want, to put some additional space between the heading and uh, the, the paragraph below it. So margins can be anywhere, all right? Margins can be on any element. So. And in some cases, you don't want that flexibility, you know. Some cases, you may have a very specific design that you want to have laid out that looks a very specific way. And regardless of the screen sizing, it, it's sort of glued into place, in which case there'd be a cause to do it. So again, in this example, yeah, you know, um, the way we set the margin, we do it in, in, in a certain way. Um, in this case, we use 0px and auto, and that handles it the way we want to in this one. We really don't have the need to do anything different. But there'll be other cases where we could do. And it's, you know, that's the way the language works, and you have the flexibility to, to do it. So if you look at W3 schools, for example, and the reason I say this is as you're reading and reading examples and all that, um, it's important to know when there's sort of like alternatives to do it different ways. Because you might read in one book, doing it one way, you might see in another book it's doing it another way. So, you know, you may have your favorite way of doing it, but you should at least recognize the other way. So if we look at W3 schools, <coughs> and 
and we were to look at CSS, let's look for example, and it would be any of the tags that have the same beginning part. But So let's look at model. All right. Oh, did I say model? Let's look at border. They talk about the border style, which, ooh, better get the video and, and edit it. I said border type. That should be border style. My mistake. I say border style and border width. Then border color. Now you actually can go crazier than that if you want. You can put borders on the top, bottom, left, and right. And you can change the border style, the border width, or the border color going all the way around. So actually the extreme I went to, you can even take it further. So I could say not just border style, but border top style, border right style, border bottom style. So like in this case, you get this. There's actually two different border styles. The top and bottom have one, the left and right have another. How do you suppose we could do this to accomplish an underline? Let's say I want my H1s to be underlined. There is a underline tag in HTML, but we don't want to use that, right? Why don't we want to use that? We don't want to use that because, you know, that's an aspect of the appearance. It's not any meaning, you know, it's just that we're underlining the, board, uh, the, the, the headers to make them stand out a little bit more. If I wanted to put an underline underneath this, I would go in and I'd say H1 border, bottom, and then I could do individually style, width, color, or I could combine them into one declaration again and say bottom, two pixel, red, dotted. And I have underneath the H1, I have that. If you remember, I was playing around with the height to get the height to, to line up correctly for that. It might make more sense if I put this on the H2. Then it would be more the effect that I was looking to get. All right, there we go. All right, so anywhere where you see these attributes like this, where they all start with the same name and have a dash, you can use that shorthand. And I think, yeah, here they talk about the shorthand property. So you could do, you know, border of five pixel solid red, or you can set them individually. Which one you use is entirely your preference, but it's good to know them both because, you know, nine times out of ten I make the border the same going all the way around, but that tenth time I might want the border to look a little bit different on the bottom than on the top, or I might want to have a, a border only on the bottom and not on the top or sides. All right, so that's shorthand CSS properties. Second thing I want to talk about is fonts, all right, because fonts sort of have the same thing. Uh, interestingly uh, enough though, I typically when I make a font, I will use the, 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 the long way around with that. I typically don't combine it in there, but you probably could, all right? Uh, I would imagine you could anyhow. Now, truth be told, this is not a good declaration for font family. I said font, font family Verdana. What's wrong with that? Why is that not good? And the answer isn't because you don't like Verdana. All right. Because it's not defined in the whole body. Okay. 
but I might want that. All right, that that's not the part that is intrinsically bad for that. Not if I not if I don't want to change it, and I'm changing some of that other information and some of the other rules. There's something specific about this. Let's make let's change this. What is the most famous font in the world? No, Helvetica. Why do I say Helvetica is the most famous font in the world? Because Helvetica is the only font for which there has been a major motion picture created about it. Let's go to IMDB. I'm not making this up. I show it in my multimedia class. Helvetica. A movie about the font Helvetica. And it's about how it evolved and how it's used. And the amazing thing, I, I show it to my multimedia class, and the amazing thing is, is when you watch it, you'll realize, like, gee, Helvetica is everywhere. Like, let me put my vitamin water underneath the camera here. This, if I'm not mistaken, the word vitamin is in Helvetica. All right? Helvetica is all over the place. All right? And again, this is a great movie. If you, if anyone has Netflix streaming, it's available on there. Watch it. You know, I should make that an extra credit assignment. But it, I find it entertaining. But that may say more about me than it does the movie. All right. I will say it is the best typography movie I've ever seen in my life. All right. I'm going to say that too without having, without having seen it. Right. Exactly. How many others have I seen? Yeah. Uh, well, let me think. Uh, all right. So, Helvetica is all over the place, except there's one very common place where Helvetica cannot be found. Does anyone know where that place is? Jeopardy question. This is a little bit of a trick question, because it's not a place like Illyria, you know, or, or that. It's more of a virtual place. No. Well, well, you're getting warm. Not necessarily a newspaper. It does have to do with computers. Windows machines. There's no Helvetica on Windows machines. Let's go up into, and I hope this doesn't make a liar out of me because, you know, things do change. Exactly. Um, but, like, by default, which this probably has default settings. So let's go into Word. That's okay, there's nothing to see. All right. Type in an A. Let's go look in my list of fonts. All right. No Helvetica to be found on a Windows machine. Why not? And they didn't pay for the license to use Helvetica. All right. So I go and I see the movie Helvetica. I think it's the best movie I've ever seen. All right. That's a stretch. Um, but I do decide I want to use it on my assignment. So I go in and I put in the font Helvetica. And I go and save it. And go and look at my page. It did change it. This might actually have, the browser may actually have something um, special. Oh, this is Google Chrome. Let's do this in IE. Because Google Chrome might have done some shenanigans to make it appear right. Let's go and view it in IE. Oh. No, IE did too. All right, it's possible that it was added on and just not available through Word. The point is it, is, it is possible for me to specify a font that doesn't exist on a machine. All right. So this was a bad example because apparently Helvetica does exist on this machine. I just didn't see it. So what do you do? You supply, you supply a secondary font. All right. And say if this font isn't available on the machine, 
Here's the second font that I want you to use. All right. Now, as it turns out, Microsoft created Arial, which is a clone of Helvetica. All right. So, typically, what you'll see people do a lot of times is go into their style sheet and say Helvetica, Arial, and then finally Sans Serif. The last font is a generic font which means the browser's generic sans serif font, whatever that happens to be. So I may be using a Linux machine or whatever, all right? Or maybe not even that, maybe a, a phone, a device, a Blackberry, who knows? A web browser will have a generic sans serif font. So the way this works is the browser tries to apply the first font to the text. If it has it, fine, it's done. If not, it goes down the line until it finds a font that it does have or it hits this generic font, all right, which it, every browser should have a generic sans serif font, all right? Yes? Okay, so you started down the path. What happens if you just put Helvetica in there, you end this thing, and you go into some sort of black hole? No, it, the browser the browser would use the default tech, the default. So what I had expected to see was Time New Times New Roman on there, but uh, I'm not sure if the browsers now are a little more sophisticated, or maybe Helvetica's installed or somewhere on here or whatever. But yeah, it would it, it uh, effectively that style rule just wouldn't work. So all we're doing here by adding the secondary and third style is we're controlling the browser. Exactly, exactly. We're we're, we're telling the browser how we want it to look. All right. Keep in mind that's, for the most part, well, I, I don't want to say that. But generally, if you mess up, and again, know that this is a general statement, it's not meant to be a blanket statement. Generally, if you mess up a CSS rule, it'll act as though there's no CSS rule at all, and it will just display unstyled. That is, if you mess it up horrifically, like if you use the wrong syntax. Like, for example, if I didn't get font family right, you know, I spelled it wrong. It's not as though my text isn't going to work. It's that it's going to display it using the browser's default font. All right. So same thing here. If I if I made up a font here, <coughs> what am I doing? Let's make up a font of Zeller's New Roman. It's not as though it's not going to display the text. It just doesn't know the font. And it will use the default font. Now if I did this, Zeller's New Roman, comma, Helvetica, Arial, and so on. It will go down the list till it, the browser hits one that it has, in this case, Helvetica or, or Arial or whichever one it hit. All right, so the big point here is when you supply a font, you supply not one font, but you typically supp supply a list of fonts. Now, if you look, do some Googling, let's look for web safe fonts. They have a list of things that typically go together.
so these typically go together. Don't use Comic Sans. But like this, typically again go together. I guess how would you test it? You'd test it by like going in and getting rid of the one font temporarily to see how the page looks with the secondary font and so on. Or, or spell, spell the first font wrong or whatever and then go back and correct it. But again, yeah, all your font family declarations should have multiple fonts uh, for that. At the very least, there should be two. There should be the one that you want followed by a generic serif or sans serif. If you want to supply like they do in this case, Georgia serif. All right. They say, I want to use the Georgia font, but if it's not available, use a generic serif font. Now, I talked about serif and sans serif fonts in this class. Yeah, serifs are the little thingies on the end of letters and sans serif is without them. Typically what you notice is that um, for smaller text, those little thingies, those serifs sometimes get in the way. So a lot of times headlines will be in uh, serif text because that does make it more readable provided the text is big enough. But uh, the, the body of articles will typically be sans serif. And I think we looked at either the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or something and saw that that was the case there. All right. Our next sort of loose end from previous class is how to pick good colors. All right. If we went in here, we could... Let's say, well, let's start with, a, start with a brand new example. I'm going to start with a brand new example. And I was going to pick some colors let's say. Let's start with a fresh CSS page. Let's go into the HTML for this, and I'll get rid of this image, because I want to do everything with, with color on this page. Okay, so I go and save it, and right now there's nothing in the CSS file, so it's just going to be a plain text. I stand corrected. I, I do have stuff in the CSS file. Let's take all that stuff out. All right, here's our plain HTML page. No styling whatsoever. So let's go and let's think of the colors that we want to have associated with this. Well, skiing is an outdoor sort of activity, and it's a winter activity. So we probably wouldn't want to use like oranges and yellows, right? We probably would want to use some shades of blue, let's say. All right, I'm going to, uh, okay. Just want to make sure I wasn't seeing things. If someone had a dog that was walking past. They were using a seeing eye dog. I just want to make sure, you know, the hallucinations hadn't started again. I'm just kidding, folks. Um, so let's say we want to have blue. Blue's a, a, cool, a cool color, they call it, you know, in the spectrum. It's not the reds and oranges and yellows, which, you know, evoke the sunlight. But, you know, bluish is sort of a cool color. So let's go in and let's take a shot. At, at making some blues. All right. Now, if you remember, with our RGB color scheme, we can express colors by saying two digits for red, 
two digits for green, two digits for blue. And the values of the digits go from 0 through F, unlike our number system that go from 0 through 9. So F is as high as it can be, and two Fs are the, the absolute highest that that can be. F is the highest any individual digit can be. Two Fs is like 99. It's the highest in both positions, whereas zero is the lowest. So if I did this, this would be like a real blue blue. Using the technical terminology there. Not a fake blue, but a blue blue. All right, so if I went body... background blue. This is going to be the color that we get. All right. Which, eh, kind of hard to read, even if I did have the projector on. All right. Well, let's go and let's make the text white. All right. So I'll say color white. Besides saying blue, I could say 0000, zero, zero, zero FF. That should be blue as well. And we go here, sure enough that's blue, and we have a color of white. At least it's legible. Our link isn't legible. What I could do in the style sheet for a link is I could say A background white. And now we can at least see the link. Now let's say I didn't want it to be this blue-blue. I could play around with it to make other shades of blue, right? So I could, what would happen if I made this a lower number? Something like 99. Nine. Describe what that color would be. It would be a darker shade of blue. Sure enough, there's a darker shade of blue. What if I were to make it something like a 1? What would that be? Well, not translucent. Actually, yeah, actually not, not pale, but it would be very dark. Because what we're doing, and remember, the higher the number is, the more brightly the light's shining. So if we turn the light off with a lower number, that means it's going to be darker. So this is going to be, you probably won't even be able to tell the difference between this and black. Sure enough, yeah. that to me looks like black. All right. So let's go back to, what did we have before, 9-9? Nine, nine. Look at this. All right. If we want to make this a lighter color, a paler blue, what would we do? Add to the green and red. And that seems paradoxical, but essentially what we're doing is we're making the whole color brighter. We've already sat, we already made the blue, you know, um, and you know, if we take it up to FF, we can make the blue as saturated as we want to, but if we want to make it pale, we have to make it more like white. So we'd go in and we'd add a little bit of green and red. So let's do A, 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 A. And if we look, all right, that's that shade of blue. Now, we could sit here and guess with that, but that would get that'd be tedious and... and, and a problem. So what we do is we go to an HTML color chart. And this will make our job a little bit easier. There's any number of these available. I don't like that one.
All right, well, this looks better. All right, I could go pick the one that I want. And let's say this is the one I want. All right, it gives me the hex code, 99CCFF. So I can go and pop that in there in my style sheet. And I got it. There's that shade of blue. All right. So I can use this, this color chart to pick the colors I want. Now here's where the problem comes in. Unless you've got a really good eye for this, picking contrasting colors can be hard. All right. Because, you know, the lesson I learned, I don't practice it, but I learned the lesson, is that just because two things are blue doesn't mean that they match. So if you have a blue shirt and a blue pair of pants, they could horribly clash if they're different kinds of blue. If one's maybe a, a, a purplish kind of blue and the other's a pale blue or eggshell blue or whatever. All right. So I could take a shot still with these and I could say, well, let's go in and let's add maybe this shade of blue. 6600CC. So maybe I'll make the headers, the H1s, give a background of 6600CC. And unless I'm really lucky, that probably won't look that good. really doesn't go well together. How do you do that? How do you find matching colors? Well, again, the one way to do it is if you have a really good eye for it. All right. Another way to do it is there are actually, um, there are actually generator programs that will allow you to say sort of what color you want and it will give you shades that complement each other very well. You know, and it does it scientifically. It, it, it takes the guesswork out of it. So even someone that, that doesn't have a good eye for it can do that. So let's go in and let's, let's look for one of those. HTML color scheme generator is usually what I Google for. We will stop and observe the irony of the fact that the colors on this page are such that it's very difficult to read, <laughs> all right, for these disabled ones. But you essentially have choices of different color schemes, and we'll look at these. The basic, the most simple is monochromatic, which means that you're going to have different shades of the same color, all right. So in following through this example, let's say I want a different shade of blue. I can go and I can move this around till I get to the kind of blue I want. And as I'm doing it, you notice know, as I'm moving that little circle around, I can change the shade. When I find one I want, these are the colors that go well together. And if I hover my mouse over it, it uh, shows me the hex code for it, or if I click on color list, it will show me the hex code for it. So, in this case, I'm going to go and I'm going to pick a couple of these colors. So I'll go and pick that for my background of my page, because that's a nice light color for the background of my page. And maybe I will use this one for my H1s. And then maybe another one for my H2s. Maybe I'll use this one for my H2s. You, thank you. So now if we go and look, again, 
those colors are very complementary for each other. And again, obviously we could go and we could, we could bump this up a little bit and we could make some changes to it. Uh, there is a thing that, that allows you to customize this um, adjust scheme to make it a little brighter or a little lighter. So if I said, well, you know, I actually want it to be a little bit lighter, let's say, or I want greater contrast or whatever, that might actually be a good one for our winter thing because that's, that's kind of cool colors. In fact, let me go and grab those. Okay, we'll grab this as being the page background, which if you notice is a very, very pale shade of blue. Almost white. How do I know that? Because if all six of these were F's, it would be white. All right. The blues are turned all the way up, so I know it's going to have a bluish tint. These two are turned a touch down, so I can almost conclude that this is going to be kind of like a bluish uh, that is very close to white. All right. I can then go in and grab the other colors for the contrasting. Let's grab. this one for one of the headers and this one for another header. Now if we save it and view it, it looks like that. Which doesn't look very good with the white type, but we could go and change that. We could make the, the type black or, or whatever. Is there a generator that, that connects the hex formula to Pantone colors? To what colors? Pantone colors, black colors, but can't. Not that I know of. Yeah. We could go and we could. Let's just do this. We'll move the color white instead of being on the body to being on the H1. And this should be a little more readable. There we go. All right. So without really knowing a lot and not necessarily having a good eye for colors, I'm able to generate a pretty nice color scheme. In addition to the colors that it generates for you, you can always consider that you have like white and black as freebies. All right, and probably any gray as well. All right, white, black, and gray, since those really don't have a, a, a tint to them, you can almost consider those as fair game to use. Now, you might say to yourself, what's wrong with this color generator? It only gave me five colors. Why did it only give me five colors? Well, well, yeah, that, well, that's why, all the shade, that's why all five colors are different shades of blue. But even if I pick complementary colors, all right, or triad, it's still only giving me five of them. Why does it only give me five of them? Exactly, because you probably don't want to use more than five, right? The whole idea of using color is, yes we, want you, yes, we want to use color to make it look nice. Yes, we want to use color to evoke a mood. All right? If you notice, and again, by no means do I think this is a completed web page. All right? But still, it looks so much nicer than the plain white and black and all that. It's just as legible. All right? And it goes at least take some baby steps as far as creating a mood for this page. We're using cool colors, all right, so therefore, you know, we're, we're, you know this is a, a cold sport, so we're using cool colors, all right. So it goes far in creating a mood, it looks good, it's not quite as boring and all that. That's one purpose for colors. The other purpose for colors is to indicate meaning, all right, to point out that something is different, 
about this. To make things stand out, in other words. All right? We want, for example, maybe the company banner to stand out, so we put it in a different color. We might, may want the navigation to stand out, so we put it in a different color. The problem is that if we use too many different colors to the point where everything's a different color, then nothing really stands out. Nothing really jumps out. All right? It's like someone that yells all the time. Someone that yells all the time, they're always screaming, you can't tell when they're mad or not. Right? If, however, you have a person that's very quiet, and one time they yell, ooh, you're going to notice that. All right? Same thing with colors. If everything is a bunch of wild different colors, even if they look, even if they look good, then nothing really stands out. Everything is its own piece and, and, and the user is conflicted about what it is they're supposed to focus on. If, however, you carefully and judiciously choose a few colors, that can go a long way in focusing the user about what's important about the page, what's different about the page. So five colors, when you add in white and black and possibly uh, uh, grays, you, you have a pretty good size palette. All right, I would really doubt that you would, you would want to go with that. Many times I wouldn't necessarily even use file five colors. So again, the fact that it only gives you five colors is actually doing you a favor. All right, because then you're not tempted to, to, to do overkill with that. Questions about any of this? All right. As you can see, you know, I, you know, I have mentioned since the first day of class that there's a technical component like how you do this, and then there's a design component like how to do it effectively. And it's important for people involved in web development to have sort of both those skill sets. Our focus really in the first part of the class, first part of the course has been on the technical. How do we make our HTML pages? How do we make our CSS? How do we do this? How do we do that? Next week our focus is going to shift a little bit in talking about the design process. And my aim in discussing the design process is to give a bigger view of the design process than someone might have that, that, that hasn't done web development. A lot of people think that web design is a matter of picking nice pictures, picking nice fonts, picking nice colors, and putting them together. That's an aspect of web design. But just like, an, just like picking what color a car is going to be and what color the interior is, is an aspect of automobile design. But that's really not the most important part of automobile design, right? Making sure the vehicle is safe, making sure the vehicle has good gas mileage, making, for, making sure the vehicle is well built and doesn't require a lot of repair. Those are really the things that are the important part about vehicle design. Yeah, the colors are important, the trim's important, the cup holders are important, but that's sort of on a different level. And we'll see there's sort of the same sort of different levels of design in web design. And, and we'll do that next week. To, to, my hope would be to give you a broader view of the notion of, of web design than you, than you might get. Um, or that someone that, that really wasn't into this field might have. All right. Questions? To do what? To create a sidebar in your page instead of just straight, just Okay. We have not learned how to do that yet, and that will be via CSS. Okay, it will be. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can use... We can use, uh, we can use the aside tag, right. but it's not going to put it on the side. Right. All right? So yeah. Um, the, the aside tag says, logically, this is not part of the main line. This is sort of like a side thought, a, a, a diversion or whatever. Um, so yeah, logically, that's what you put in the HTML if that's the case. Stylistically, we'll learn the CSS to do that. We haven't gotten that yet. If you have not already looked at the requirements for the project, you should start looking at that over the weekend because that will come into play as we talk about design. All right. 
thought I was going to end on time today, but no such luck. All right, we'll see you in lab.